Okay, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Amina Shakir, and we want to welcome you to the History of Black Women in Health plenary section. Uh, I am from Florida a &M University, and I'm happy to be here at Asala. <laughs> happy to be here at Asala. Um, and so unfortunately, we had a couple of other panelists who would have been here with us as well, but they are not able to make it. Um, but our vision for this panel was really to um, talk about not only some of the larger histories around Black women, but in particular to talk about the intersection of Black women and health. Um, this conference this year, as many of you know, has been all about uh, health, and we want to really kind of target in on, in particular, the ways in which Black women as writers, as activists, right, are taking on this issue, uh, but also how they come to this work, uh, some of the the methodological ways in which they do this work and some of the ways that they help to continue to move the history of Black women forward, uh, largely through the landscape and purview of health. So I will give a short bio of both uh, Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens and also Michelle Browder. Uh, I'll have a few questions right for them. We'll kind of go through some of that dialogue. And then we want to hear from you, right? Uh, we want to open it up to you all um, if there are other questions, comments, or uh, things that you would like to share. Uh, so first, Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens uh, is the Linda and Charles Wilson Professor of History of Medicine and Director of Humanities and Medicine Program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. One of two Black women in the nation uh, who holds these positions, Dr. Deidre Cooper Owens also serves as the Director of the Program of African American History at the Library Company of Philadelphia, the country's oldest cultural institution. She is in uh, an organization of historians, OAH, distinguished lecturer, a past American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists Research Fellow, and has won several prestigious honors and awards for her scholarly and advocacy work in the history and reproductive and birthing justice. Most recently, uh, the University of Virginia Schools of Nursing selected Dr. Cooper Owens as a 2022 Agnes Dillon Randolph Award winner for her scholarship on the history of Black nurses and healers, which is their highest honor. A popular public speaker and writer, Dr. Cooper Owens has published articles, essays, book chapters, and op-eds on the issues uh, that concern African-American historical experiences and reproductive justice. Her first book, Medical Bondage, Race, Gender, and the Origins of American Gynecology, won the Darlene Clark Hine Book Award from the Organization of American Historians as the best book written in African-American women's, women's and gender history. It has recently been uh, translated into Korean and will be translated into Brazilian Portuguese by winter 2022. She is currently working on a popular biography of Harriet Tubman uh, through the lens of disability and a monograph about the history of race, medical discovery, and the C-section. Our next speaker uh, that will be here with us today, Michelle Browder, um, is a nationally recognized artist and activist. Her work has been exhibited in four galleries, including the Rosa Parks Museum here in Montgomery, Alabama. Browder has taught at the Valent Cross Boys School in Montgomery, Alabama, at the Atlanta Juvenile Detention Center, and launched the Haven at Crossroads After School Program, Arts Program in Montgomery. She is the owner and operator of More Than Tours, a tour company which provides educational tours about racial bias and history to students and tourists here in Montgomery. She has appeared on PBS NewsHour, The Today Show, and has been featured in the Boston Globe, The Preservation Magazine, National Geographic, and The New York Times. And in her current role, and the reason why we have her here today um, is because she is the founder and the director of the Mothers of Gynecology, which she's gonna talk a little bit more about that organization and their exhibition and some of the other work that she's doing. So welcome. Thank you so much for being with us today. 
So uh, the first thing we kind of want to talk a little bit about, and uh, Dr. Cooper opens, you can go first. Um, it's just how did you come to this work? And uh, I know that's a very broad question, <laughs> uh, but how did you come to, to this work with Black women and health histories? Thank you. And thank you all who are attending virtually, those who are in the audience. I, I am so appreciative. Um, I'm going to do what I was trained to do. I, I, I want to shout some people out who inspired me. Um, and I do this a lot, but there are two women who are not in this room, although they are at the conference, uh, Vanessa Northington Gamble and Evelyn Hammonds, who are um, really the, the creators of what I do in terms of race and medicine um, and women's history. And so it was really through their, their scholarship and later their mentorship. Also, Deborah Gray White just came in. Deborah, I know you don't like all the uh, shine and attention, but had it not been for Dr. Deborah Gray White, who wrote uh, Aren't I a Slave, Female, or Aren't I a Woman, excuse me, Female Slaves in the Plantation South in 1985, there would not be a Deirdre Cooper Owens. So thank you um, for, for her work and her scholarship. And then this is just a personal shout out. My, my cousin, Sam Livingston, hey, I, I come from a family where I'm kin to a lot of black historians right here at this conference. He just came in. He is a chair at uh, Morehouse in African-American studies and history. And it's really our family from the Williamsburg County, King Street, South Carolina, that taught us to love our people and our stories. And so thank you, Sam, for, for being here and supporting me. Um, so those are the kind of big reasons why I got into Black history. But really, I wanted to learn about myself. I mean, no bones about it. I went to Bennett College, which is a Black women's college in Greensboro, North Carolina. And so before there were things like African and women's studies, um, Bennett College taught us about ourselves. And so I was always interested in learning about myself, um, historically, socially, culturally. Um, and so, I didn't know I would become a historian, but I had always been inspired by those stories, by those, those books I've mentioned. And by the time I made it to Clark Atlanta for my, for my master's in African-American studies with a history focus, I, I knew I wanted to study Black people. I just wasn't sure it would ever be slavery or the history of medicine. But the more I learned, the more I gravitated towards that field. And so by the time I got to UCLA, I was fortunate to have a Black woman advisor, Brenda Stevenson. And I, I just kept vacillating, vacillating. And finally, Brenda, <laughs> Brenda said, either you're going to pick a topic or I'm going to give it to you. So I was in a class. And because Janetta Cole and Beverly Guy Schefter wrote a book called Gender Talk, they wrote literally a paragraph, just a few sentences about this man named James Marion Sims. I never heard of him, father of American gynecology, never heard of him in my life. But what intrigued me was the couple of sentences where they detailed he had experimented on enslaved women. And I was like, wait, what? Because this was 2005. There was no Henrietta Lacks story or book. There had been no mothers of gynecology, you know, monuments or anything. So I remember calling my mother who had a degree in, in science. And I said, mother, had you ever heard of this before? She said, no. And I knew at that moment I had a dissertation. Now, fast forward, by the time I graduated in 08, and by the time my book was published in 2017, things had changed. There had been a growing, um, a growing uh, interest in the field, but politically and culturally things had changed. And who really brought me into the fray were other Black women, not necessarily academics, but activists on the ground, where I was in New York at the time. They were trying to remove uh, James Marion Sims' statue from Central Park. And there were all of these rallies and everything going on. And I was, you know, the, the book hadn't even been published yet, but my Black male editor, notice how all these Black folks have been leading and guiding me um, for a very long time. He said, you know what? We're going to ride this wave. We're going to release your book early. And that's what really made me marry the advocacy for reproductive and birthing justice with the actual historical scholarship. And I knew that I could tell a story about the history of medicine that centered Black women. And so oftentimes I'll get real angry when people only want to talk about Sims because I was like, I, hope, I wrote a whole book about Black women, right? I even have a chapter in there about Irish immigrant women. But what I really wanted to show was that as much as Black women's bodies were experimented on and knowledge was extracted from their bodies, 
they were also knowledge producers. They were also cultural producers. And they had a hand in being architects of, obst uh, obst you know, uh, of, of obstetrics and gynecology. And so that became important. For those who read the book, the very last part of the book, which in many ways I connected to symbolically was um, during, during that time I was going through IVF. So my husband and I had been trying to get pregnant. So I went through what's called two IVF trials. And for both of those trials, I had um, a cervical dilation. Now I had never been pregnant in my life to this day, never been pregnant. So I don't know what that means. I just heard cervical dilation on TV, you know? And so next thing I know, I'm like, well, they're going to boil some hot water and have a rag. Like, I didn't know. So I'm calling my mother, I'm calling my sister, my friends who had children. What does this mean? And they're telling me about centimeters and millimeters. And I'm like, I don't know, because I've never been pregnant. So I've never given birth. Like, what are they going to do? Now, mind you, this was considered one of the, the cities, and that means New York City, one of the best uh, fertility specialists in the city. I was on a waiting list, finally get in. He tells me he's going to do a cervical dilation. So I'm thinking it's going to be short and sweet and painless. He just said, oh, if you catch the subway or you drive, just make sure you take a, you know, two mitol or Motrin. I said, okay. I come in and essentially he takes a long metal brush called like a washer. And um, for, for those who've experienced pap smears, they open up the cervix, right? So that the doctor can manually see. So he holds my cervix in his hands. He takes the long metal brush and he bores a hole in my cervix. I got no anesthesia, nothing. And that moment, I remember I screamed, I screamed. It, it hurt so much I couldn't cry, I screamed. And I remember being in this like weird kind of bizarre space in my head um, because he just said, oh, I'm, I'm shocked that it, that it hurts. And then the white nurse who was there, she just glared at me like I was making too much noise. So then I had to wait 15 minutes with my feet elevated in stirrups and they left. Nobody ever came back to clean me up, nothing. So I had to, to look around the room after what I presumed was 15 minutes to clean myself up and walk across the street so I could get an HSG, which is a test where they uh, insert dye to see if there's, there are any blockages, those kinds of things. So by the time I get there, the, an, the, the ancillary staff had changed. So there were black nurses and this one black nurse saw me and she did what I imagined and Narca, Betsy, Lucy, and all the other unnamed uh, enslaved women that I write about, but whose names have been lost to the historical record did. She looked in my face and without saying, you know, like, what's wrong? She said, I've been there. And then she just held my hand. And she started to wipe my forehead and took my mind off of it. And she said, so what do you do? <laughs> and this is when a bizarre thing happened. I said, girl, you'll never guess. I'm writing a book on the history of gynecology. And she said, you gonna put this in the book, right? And I said, no, because everybody in here who is a trained historian, you know what they teach us in school, especially when you're black or you're a woman or you insert whatever, you know, marginalized title they try and give you. Oh, that's not objective. You must never insert yourself. And so I, I say to her, oh no, I can't insert myself. I was like, girl, I'm a historian. And she said, you better put this, you better put this in here. To this day, I do not know her name. I tell this story all the time. I, I ended my book with that story because what I didn't know at that moment, I was a quote unquote marked woman. And I didn't even know I was a marked woman. I had written about these ideas from the 18th and the 19th century about black women not experiencing pain. How did I guess that with all the so-called markers of my middle-class respectability, Mary Check? Heterosexual check, professor check, you know, all of these things that I was marked already. My body had already had an inscribed message that that doctor and that nurse knew. In fact, my body was so broken, they couldn't even inject the dye. Because in the few minutes for me leaving the table and walking to across the street, it had swollen to the point where they couldn't insert the dye, right? 
I had another HS, uh, HSG a couple of weeks later, and they had to do a cer cervical dilation before that. No anesthesia again, right? So that's when I knew I couldn't reside in the ivory tower, tower and just have the protection of that. That's when I was thankful for those doulas and midwives and birth workers and nurse practitioners and black OBGYNs who were like, sis, you gotta tell the story for the artists, for the public historians. I knew I couldn't just write a book for people to circulate in the classroom, but that these were the stories that had to be told. These were the historical gaps in knowledge that had not been told in a more widely uh, communicated way because they had been literally erased and effaced from the record. So that's what brought me to it much more recently than I'm almost embarrassed to admit. It was in 2017. The question is what brought me to this work? Mm -hmm. Will y'all indulge me for a minute? I get emotional <laughs> when I think about the history of Montgomery, Alabama. So it would be that lift every voice and sing. Y'all know that? Have y'all sung it while you've been here? Did you sing it yet? We're at a solid and we have not sung. Can you please stand up and indulge me just for one? Is it okay? I'm not academia, sis. I don't know. I'm just trying to get this thing. <laughs> Is it okay? Can we do that? Just the first set. Just the first stanza. Y'all ready? If you don't know it, just. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Y'all ready? Let's go. Come on. Lift every voice and till earth and ring with the heart. of liberty let our rejoicing rise high as, as the listening sky let it ring sound loud as the rolling sea one more sing a song sing a song Full of the faith that the darkness has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun. Come on, y'all. Facing the rising sun Woo. of our new day. Let us march on till victory. Somebody harmonize. Is one. I'm sorry, we just had to do it. Okay, now what was the question? <laughs> What was the question again? So tell us a little bit more, Michelle, about how you came to your work as an artist and activist around uh, women's gynecology. That song right there. <laughs> that song right there. Uh, simply because when I was uh, growing up in Verbena, Alabama, a little small town, 1,500 people, they didn't teach me my history. They said that Dr. King had a dream and Rosa Parks had aching feet. And that was the extent of the history lesson and that we, we all were black slaves and niggas. That was the extent of my education until I went to school at the Art Institute of Atlanta, suspended for three, three times, suspended from school for fighting folks who called me the N word. And my dad, first black prison chaplain, appointed by George Wallace, said, you're not going to sit here and watch Oprah Winfrey all day. I'm going to bring you some paint, some tin tubes of paint and some T-shirts, and I want you to work this thing out. So my mental health at the age of 13 was on the block. Went to school, Art Institute of Atlanta. Um, there was a, a picture of J. Marion Sims. It was a, the illustrator, Robert Tom, had conducted or com was commissioned to create three, or excuse me, 45 pieces of art to show early medicine. And in 1952, when he created this painting of J. Marion Sims, it showed these three black women scared, holding their chests, um, one on the table, uh, two white doctors surrounding them. And when I, at the age of 18, I asked my professor, what does this mean? What is this? And he was like, go figure it out yourself. My portfolio was full of black folk. 
graphic designer. I had black people selling Tide, Pepsi, Coke, whatever. I use black people in my presentation. He said, you need to stay an extra couple of years to figure yourself out. You got to be a little bit more diverse than that. So I dropped out of school. So when I say I'm not academia, I mean that. <laughs> I became a college dropout, started my own business. Um, but what I wanted to do was teach young people this history. So what I did was I enrolled in, really not enrollment, but um, Shrine of the Black Madonna. Y'all know about them? In Atlanta, Georgia. They groomed me. I learned of that. Then I went to Chicago, spent time with my family, 97 in the South, I hear you, um, right off the Dan Ryan, and started listening to the pastor that was up there uh, that got Obama in trouble. What's his name? Jeremiah. Jeremiah Wright. That was my grandma's pastor. Black is black is black and be. And so when I decided to, you know, come back to Alabama at the call of my parents, um, who work with working poor and formerly incarcerated people and children who just had no direction. It's six of us. And I, to this day, I don't understand why they call me because, you know, my brother and sister, they could have did the same thing. But my parents was like, no, nope, we need you here. And so I, I came home to help them with their, their mission, which is to help love and feed people. And upon arriving here, I wanted to get down into the history, Montgomery, Alabama. You write right up Dexter. Right there before you is two, two statues or three. And one, Jefferson Davis, the father of the civil rights movement or the president of the, of the um, I'm sorry, of the um, Confederacy. I'm sorry, y'all. Oh, sorry. I knew when it came out, I was in trouble. Um, the the uh, first president of the Confederacy. And then... But you know why I think about that is because when I think about Dr. King 100 years later, given his speech, how long, not long, it's like he's there. He's right there. And then there's a, you know, a Confederate surgeon there. And then underneath the tree, hidden in plain sight, is J. Marion Sims. And knowing what he's done to Black women, Black men, Black children, it's like, why in the 21st century is this guy still here? There's a plaque that said he is the father of modern gynecology. So I started asking the question, well, where are all the mothers? Where are they at? Where's their statue? So it was women like Harriet Washington, Dr. Joy DeGruy, over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, you know, Deidre Cooper Owens, uh, all of the research that I started doing um, really started in about 2008. And it was Harriet Washington and reading her book, Medical Apartheid. And I was just like, we have to do something about this. So I said, well, I don't see the mother, so I'm a creative. And you can have it up here. You can have your little statue of J. Marion Sims, this torture, you know, this doctor who did this atrocities right here in Montgomery, Alabama, not far from where we are right now. His Negro hospital for women is just right around the corner, up the street around the corner. And I'm like, okay, so... No one wants to remove their statues. I'm gifted enough where I'm going to make one. And so that is, for seven years, I created an event called Art on a Square. And in 2020 of May, um, I asked my fellow colleagues and artisans to come up with paintings to reflect their mothers and their grandmothers. And we decorated the slave auction block in the center of our town with those photos and those paintings of Black mothers. And I'm going to leave it right there because the, y'all ain't ready for what's about to come next. So I'm going to leave it right there. Yeah, but so that's both, how I got started. So, so both of you talked right very poignantly about um, the ways your particular experiences as Black women brought you to this work, right? So um, say, could you just say a little bit more about the, the kind of role of challenging kind of public narratives um, and, and about history in particular, in your case, Michelle, like statues, monuments, right? Um, and then Deidre, I'm thinking a lot here about the way that sources, right? How do we get those voices 
right, of Black women, particularly around the, the notions of health and healing, um, when we know that Black women physicians in particular have been trained, right, for quite some time, uh, dating back as early to the mid-19th century. But it's like, so how do we continue to get those voices, recapture those voices in a way that we can center them and their particular knowledge as opposed to like these, these narratives, right, of experimentation, right, and, and like definitely those things are occurring, but right, how do Black women themselves, right, push back in, in the ways that you do that in your own work? So that's a great question, because I can tell you, I had every confidence in the ability of this being a really interesting story and a needed story. I had a Black woman uh, advisor, dissertation advisor, who was like, this is amazing, right? And then I remember the first knock was from a professor at UCLA who, who essentially said, well, well Deirdre, you don't know how to write. Now y'all read, y'all, y'all heard that impressive list. I always say success is the best, is the best flex. But according to her, I didn't know how to write. Hmm. So I'm like, wait. So I go to my advisor, who is now the first black woman at is it Oxford or Cambridge? Um, Oxford, who is an endowed chair in Oxford. She just got that about a year ago. She had won every award you could think of. So I tell her, she said, we're going we gonna to do this. This is the second time I'm telling this story. She said, let me write it. She rewrote my paper. Gave it to that same racist professor who at the time I didn't know had been sued by another black woman student, who a, a student of hers when she was at an Ivy League, who sued her and won because she did the same thing to that student who is now uh, a lead in Callie Gross. It was written in a Chronicle of High. If anybody knows Callie Gross's work, every time she publishes something, she could publish a book review. It seems like she's winning something for her writing and her genius, but Callie couldn't write either. So Brenda rewrites the paper. And of course, this is between us. I give it to this racist professor. It's just a little better, but it's, oh God, the writing is ponderous. I remember I didn't know what the word meant. So I had to go look it up. This is a small, I was like, ponderous, what does that mean? But you know, I was like, and then she went on to tell me all of these things. She assumed because she was the child of Irish immigrants. And she, she told me her parents had uh, elementary, edu uh, elementary level education that she understood being a poor black child from the South. I don't want to be like, child, my mama, Delta Sigma Theta, who graduated from Claflin College. My daddy worked at the National Archive. But of course, I didn't say this, but I'm sitting here like, what is this woman talking about? But, you know, and it was like this out of body experience. Once again, I was a marked body and didn't realize it. Thank you, Hortense Spiller, for writing that phrase in your article, um, Mama's made, Baby, Papa's Maybe. I was a marked body. So fast forward. As I'm conducting dissertation research, I was told by someone from the New York Academy of Medicine, I just asked her for finding aids on James Marion Sims as I knew he had been a president. She told me, I'm not doing your research for you. And I mean, was nasty. I went to the National Library of Medicine. I was told by the director as I was going through the boxes, he threw a pair of white gloves and told me I was uncivilized for touching the sources without my gloves okay. and that I would not be able to produce enough material except to publish a pamphlet because those people didn't write, they were illiterate. So when we talk about the archives, Marisa Fuentes has a phrase in her book about the epistemic epistemological violence of the archives. No, some, some, I mean, it ain't about epistemology. This thing is real. Like people throwing gloves at you, making you feel horrible. Because I wasn't a black genealogist at the Caroliniana Library at the University of South Carolina, and I was actually a student. So my name doesn't quite match how I look. I'm Gullah Geechee, Sam, you know that. We, we look like Benin sculptures, right? But my name is Irish, Gaelic, Deirdre. So they saw Deirdre Cooper Owens, they had, this is before you could Google folks. So they thought a white woman named Deirdre Cooper Owens was coming from UCLA to USC. And here I show up. Oh my God. The director of the Caroliniana Library was so horrible to me. He would make disparaging remarks. It was a white man there named Brian. 
my, he was truly my angel. He saw it and he would take time with me. What do you need? Because he saw it. And so he, do you need me to, to, you know, do you need me to walk with you to lunch? Do you need me to photocopy? And it was no flirty thing. He was just recognizing my humanity because he saw the violence of his boss. And so because he didn't want to lose his job, he had to show me extra humanity. So those are the things that you go through when you're in the archives, especially as a grad student. Now those same folk who's been the uh, keynote for the New York Academy of Medicine, who was the keynote for uh, what's the, uh, the National Library of Medicine, who can be the keynote for a second time at the Waring Library at the College of Charleston. My work was not even considered history of medicine until the OAH gave my book a prize. They didn't even consider it. My dear friend, Sam Roberts was the one, we were in a writing group. He said, sis, what's the first word of your book title? I said, medical. He said, what's the last word? I said, gynecology. He was like, I think you are historian of medicine. So those are the challenges sometimes. It was actually easy to write the book in terms of, cause I was just interested in how do I extract black women's stories and lives and knowledge from the record? That was easy for me. Cause I had always centered black people and black women. What was harder was the individual experience of having to, 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 to go through that kind of pain and, and abuse and not have anybody really protect you and just be told that's how, it, that's how it is when you do research. Now those people are so nice. Oh gosh, I want you to be on the board, those kinds of things. So what I try to model for my students is the real, you know, the real deal. And to know your material and know it well and be confident. If I had listened to even some of the editors at the University of Georgia Press, they would not have thought my book would do well. Consistently for five years, it has been number one and number two. For five years, I've made royalty checks bigger than some mainstream authors. I'm Every time September roll around, I'm happy. Because my royalty checks reflected, honey. Let me tell you what. That's why I got on a Gucci belt. You can't give us some money sometimes. I'm still trying to get over that hump. <laughs> I, you know. So I, because I'm like, let me just go on and treat myself. I give a lot to the folk. I give a lot to the community. But don't let me use this royalty check that they told me, you know, I wouldn't really have much interest. And that was sold almost 20,000 copies in five years. Most academic books sell three to 400 in a lifetime. And it's because of people like you all, because I knew I couldn't keep it just in the academy. So that's a kind of long-winded way of saying that I knew that there was information from the sources because I always had a healthy skepticism of the sources. Because I knew, like Michelle said, that we were more than that one-note description about Black folk. So I knew even when the most racist, most, most misogynistic uh, authors were writing about us, I had to, to look for those glimpses. How, oh my goodness, what they're describing as a, as a disturbance, as an interruption, is black, are Black people in slave communities coming up and showing humanity and care. So when they're like, oh, Jim came telling me the reason why she was sick is because she bred too much. That's Jim risking punishment mm -hmm. and corporal punishment at that to let you know as you're conducting your research the reason why she's in that way is because she's had too many pregnancies and children and that's weakened her body. So I have to look for those little hints in the records and they exist right before our faces. So that's what coming from Bennett College, Clark Atlanta University, having Brenda Stevenson, having the genius of Deborah Gray White's book and so many others, Darlene Clark Hines, the culture of, of dissimilars. You look at my bibliography, you're gonna look at the bibliography of black women writing and producing work from the late 20th century all the way up to the early 21st century. I make no bones about it because those bibliographies did not exist when I was in school. And so that was also intentional when you talk about methodologies and the sources, you can look at my, my bibliography right now, my footnotes, and let that be a syllabus for how to include Black people in your writings in important ways. So Michelle, um, you wanna talk a little bit about this from the public history space, right? So how you're kind of challenging particular narratives um, about Montgomery uh, and in the broader scope of African-American women's history around the, the space of gynecology and obstetrics. 
Yeah. So it's been, um, I, let me just, can I be, I just gotta be transparent. Of course. Uh, that the mothers were built out of disappointment, you know, as a black woman, there are now, uh, laws, dub the dub act, you know, we're still being discriminated against just for simply wearing our hair in braids or locks. It was birthed out of hearing Serena Williams, millionaire married to a white billionaire. And no one believed her when she was saying that her body is either shutting down or something is wrong. The mothers were birthed out of Susan Moore, doctor in her profession during COVID. And she's telling them how to treat her but they said she was a drug addict. She may, So the mothers were kind of birthed out of this notion that, you know, number one, black women don't feel pain or we have a high tolerance for pain or that we're angry or we're boisterous or we're just too, you know, those monuments, those women, those girls and their stories was birthed out of a pain that I see that what we go through today, whether it's in the boardroom, whether it's you not, having your rightful pay, equal pay. Um, so that's the angle that I took it. Uh, but it's so far, it's so much more advanced and vast uh, with, with what we're trying to do in terms of women's bodies. I just turned 51 and <laughs> nobody told me about these night sweats. Nobody told me about this. Like you feel like you're losing your mind sometimes. Nobody, am I the only one up in here? I'm just saying, but I mean, you know, but basically, it's like, who are we as Black women and what the medical arena has failed to tell us about our bodies? That is my main reason. And then with the history here in Montgomery, Alabama, eugenics, sterilization, the Rail sisters, looking at all of this history that we don't talk about, how Hitler got his concept from us. But yet we're such a law-abiding, God-fearing nation. I walk around with a chip on my shoulder, y'all. I'm just going to be honest. And so the only way that I can remedy, remedy it is just to create art and use that art piece as a way to educate. And living in Montgomery, Alabama, anybody from Montgomery? Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> living in Montgomery can be very challenging because we have a governor who refuses to acknowledge what the prison system is doing, yet we'll, we'll throw billions of dollars here, but we have mental illness with men and women coming out of prison. So my pieces, my art is basically centered around trying to change the narrative about black folks. Red glasses, look again, respect the wound, dismantling the racism that's so persistent in, in healthcare today, it breaks my heart. And the only way that I can stay sane in America is to create art that speaks to the issue and the issue is they don't see us. In 2022, they don't see us, they don't believe us. But then my hope is talking about women like Oni Lee Logan, the midwife down in Mobile that you know caught all these babies. And when the white doctor told her to go back to Africa after 1976, they ended midwifery in this state. Doctor told her to go back to Africa. She said, you go back because I ain't never been. It's women like that that causes me the history like that of your Lucille Times who actually beat up the guy that arrested Rosa Parks. You know what I'm saying? So it's um, that's what I'm challenging right now is bringing forth those stories that are so meaningful uh, to us as Black women and Black men and Black children um, that keeps this narrative going for me. And you said, um, Amina, that made me think, and, and also a part of your answer, Michelle, where I I speak to a lot of folk around the nation. Um, I always joke I'm still on the academic chitlin circuit. So sometimes it's large and fancy, sometimes it's not so fancy. But people are always, and by people, I mean Black women in particular, are always interested um, in really having a good grasp of what these black healers and birth workers were producing for, for healing care. 
And someone, and I was just on a panel about um, folk who are writing biographies of, of Black historical subjects. And someone said, you have to be respectful of what the historical subject wants you to reveal. And I'm writing about enslaved women who I'd say in over 95% of the cases did not leave written records. And their lives were really, I mean, the most private parts of their lives were made public against their, their will. And so, you know, I, I can tell I disappoint people. I'll say, well, I don't, I don't have recipes. You know, I don't have those kinds of things because a part of the methodological line of ethics for me, I'm already discussing the most intimate parts of these women's lives. You know, and I have to ask, do did they want anybody to know they were raped? D you know, did Anarcha Betsy and Lucy and the other women who Sims had leased and owned, would they have wanted folk to have known that they were undergoing these painful surgeries that took them away from their families and the intense psychological and emotional, emotional um, health uh, hits they had to sustain? Like, is that something that they would have wanted people to know? Would they have wanted people to see them as weak? Um, so I'm always cognizant of what to reveal and also know that a part of the strength um, of our communities past and present is knowing what to keep in house amongst ourselves um, and knowing how to discuss and strategize in those particular ways. So there, there is this challenge, I think, when you are a historian who's dedicated your life to, to exploring and analyzing and revealing and writing about enslaved people, where you have to toe a real ethical line. Um, I'm much more cautious now than, than when I was in grad school. You know, and this was a dissertation because I just wanted it all out for them to see the atrocities people went through. But I think that was more about me and my anger. Um, now I'm much more attentive to asking questions about what the historical folks that I center in my work would want us to know. And how can I also maybe infer a thing? Um, so if I found a recipe, I don't know if I would write it in my book. Um, those, those are things I, I grapple with. You know, I, I will just say the things I'll, you know, I'll point people to the sources that are already out there. And so I think that's a part of the kind of um, public educative mission that we can have as public historians, um, as more, you know, quote unquote, traditional scholars to be able to say, you know, well, these people were knowledgeable. And so they use cotton root in certain ways to um, not extend pregnancies. That doesn't mean about abortion, but just birth control. Um, you know, th those kinds of things to be able to, to say that, um, to, you know, to, to maybe provide insight in those ways. But there is, I think, this kind of methodological um, and ethical line that we have to be aware of when we're writing about these kinds of um, historical moments and atrocities that happened with health and, and health care, supposedly. Yeah, so you really um, bring up some good points, right, in terms of kind of where is the field of Black women's studies, particularly around um, the issues of health and healing going, right? There's kind of this public consumption now around notions of self-care, right, uh, no matter what you may think about some of the ways in which that's his phrase. Um, but uh, there's much more attention now to, um, in particular, how uh, health and healing and the role of Black women have been significant in this field. So could you talk a little bit more about maybe some of the new approaches that you may be using in your own work or um, some of the things that you may find of value in particular to kind of pushing, uh, continue to push this field forward? Oh, that's great. I, you know what I'm finding really useful? We're moving away from conversations of like the body mm -hmm. <laughs> and we're really talking about lives um, and, and seeing people as not just kind of symbols. Sometimes I think we can get so caught up in the sim symbolism, um, but, but to really think about people as flesh and blood human beings. So that's important. Um, a lot of the academic work that I'm also following because it just, uh, real talk, my schedule, I do a lot of traveling. Um, I look on academic Twitter a lot 
when I'm doing community talks um, uh, and, and consultations with different organizations and things, I'm looking at what they're telling me. Um, sometimes the, the the Twitter threads and the IG pages, like the NAP ministry. I know a lot of folk have heard about this, the woman who created the NAP ministry. She's just like, Black women, rest, please. <laughs> like, like, go to sleep, rest, take a nap. And she's her, she's having a book published. Um, there's a woman who calls herself uh, Sabia Wade, who calls herself the Black doula. And you know, she is combining activism and scholarship and um, self-care in, um, I think, really accessible ways. There are a number of doulas and midwives who do a lot of great public interfacing work. So it moves us away from these discussions of the body and just stats and figures um, to really understanding um, these women as, as three-dimensional. The other thing that I think is important too is the conversation that um, especially a lot of junior scholars I see following in the footsteps of a Hortense Spillers or Sadia um, Hartman or Marisa Fuentes, like they are really interrogating the archives in important ways that it's not the end all be all. And sometimes I'll be honest with you for a historian who is so dependent on the archives, sometimes you feel like your toes are being stepped on, but you got to remove yourself from that and really understand what that means and and also understand how people are resistant to that. My other job is, as Amina mentioned, I'm the director of uh, the, the program in African-American history at the Library Company of Philadelphia. I always want to put the, the country's oldest cultural institution in quotes. Because I was like, how does one really date culture? But But because Benjamin Franklin founded it in 1731 and it's been continuous, it's considered the country's oldest cultural institution, right? But one would argue the Black church, the Black family. I mean, we, you know, the, how, how do you date that, right? Um, but anyway, I remember one of the librarians saying to us as a group of colleagues, oh, I'm just so happy we don't have to get into those kinds of political conversations because we're just a repository of documents. And I was like, oh, who put the documents in there? I was like, if I read every source, and the library company is known for being one of the country's top repositories for documents like pre-1900. So I said, if we were to look at all of these documents, and there are over a million of them, I said, and let's just let's just pick a pick a century, let's say the, the 17th century, so the 1600s, almost every description of a then called Negro or African, or you know, all the different kinds of terms that they would use was negative. Black people were pathological, they were criminal, they were abnormal. The ways in which they would talk about black people, you know, you would think from those documents that black people were somehow aliens, like I mean, space aliens, <laughs> subhuman. So I'm like, how in the world? I was like, that was Benjamin Franklin and his rich buddies donating these sources. You didn't have women don donating the sources, white or black or, or indigenous. You didn't have black people do donating the sources until the 20th century. So I was like, if you read this, you're gonna come away uncritically thinking that black people are naturally dispossessed to all things that are pernicious and evil and criminal and bad. And she had never thought, well, I had never thought about it like that. I said, that's why I'm in this position. I'm supposed to make you think about it like that. That is not just a building that holds documents, but they are political. They might be inanimate objects. They're, they're pieces of paper. Some of them are ephemera, and yet they hold political meanings. So that's also something where the archives is coming out, which I'm really, really grateful for. There's also a lot of emergent work in disability studies. So that's my, my popular biography of Harriet Tubman will be about her as a disabled woman. It's not going to be the totality of it, but it will function um, because I think, you know, largely in the book, because she she became disabled. Talk about workplace injuries. She became disabled when she was enslaved. Wrong place, wrong time. Literally a runaway 14-year-old boy is in a country store. The overseer is on his heels. Tells little Harriet, Harriet as a grown woman was never more than five feet tall. Petite. Tells her as a child between 12 and 13, go on and catch him. 
and she's enslaved. So she was like, <laughs> she had her, she folded her arms like, uh-uh. So he gets so angry, he goes to pick a weight to throw at the boy. It hits her in the head. So from the time she's an adolescent, we don't even know if she's quite a teenager yet. From the time she's an adolescent till she dies at the age of 91, she is disabled. And this is the thing. There's never any shame. She talks about that. And Black women scholars who are now writing about her are seeing, wait a minute, she had been so open about her life as a disabled woman. She never had children naturally. That resonates with me. I'm 50. I know I don't look at y'all, but I'm 50. And, and I've never had children. What does that mean for a Black woman in her early 20s who gets married to a Black man? She's enslaved. It, having kids, can, uh, children can increase her value. She never has them. I don't know if she was infertile, but I can surely ask the question because that would have been the moment when she was married to her first husband for her to get pregnant. In fact, she wanted to be a mother so badly that she, when she gets married the second time, adopts a young girl right, and creates the kind of family unit that she wants. Those are the questions about around sexuality that's not just about the sexual act, but what does it mean, too, to be divorced? You and your husband just ain't on the same page. Then she finds this man, they on the same page. But he's 25 years younger than. And now she's a middle-aged woman. She got this fine, y'all should look at the, the, the picture of the husband. He was fine. Got this fine young man. You know, they on the same page. Baby, I want a family. I've never been able to have that. I've been taking care of my nieces and my nephews. Let's adopt. So those kinds of studies, right, that are coming out about sexuality, that's not just about the pleasure of sex, but about what intimacy means. What about kinship in a different way about disability and what that means and then you attach it to women and women who are enslaved those are the ways that even my own thinking about this is being transformed because of what these younger scholars and I'm looking at so many of you now who are in grad school in the audience and just graduated what the public historians are 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 asking us to do what the public is asking us to write about so that they can also see themselves and also see solutions for some of the challenges that we have. Everybody is not interested in throwing away the old. Mm -hmm. I know that. I'm constantly booked for talks. So I know that, you know, these horrible things that are said about people who are quote unquote, not academics or don't have college degrees. I've heard horrible things. The masses are asses. America's a history wasteland. Tell my speaking agent that. Mm -hmm. I, in the past three weeks, I've been in Harvard, VCU, Richmond, Virginia, Montgomery, Alabama, and I'm going to be doing a UK speaking tour in England in different places. And they all want to know about the mothers of gynecology, reproductive history. So folk are interested. And I listen to the questions that they ask. And those are the things that also inform me. So it's not just about the scholarship coming out, but what are the questions and the comments that people are asking as well? I was engulfed in, in the whole conversation. Yeah, so just talk a little bit more about maybe some of your future projects. I know right now your, your medium is kind of like statues and steel, and yeah. um, but maybe some future projects that you may be working on to um, extend the, the range of the Mothers of Gynecology, which has been covered nationally, as we know. Well, <laughs> they ain't ready. Uh, <laughs> um. I didn't want to create a monument for people to come from around the country just to look at. Um, if you see these women, they're 15 feet tall, 12 feet, nine feet, and they're naked, but they're naked in metal. Um, I created a curriculum. My team and I, with the doctor, uh, Dama Riles, created a curriculum with the Adinkra symbols because each one of the mothers has an Adinkra symbol, strength and uh, God is supreme or, you know, God is knowledge. And then one is of strength. And when I travel, I used to travel when I, when I would travel overseas or I would always stay in these Airbnbs or these, what do they call them? Um, like a bunkhouse. What's it called? Uh, hostel. Hostel. <laughs> I ain't got to do that no more though. I ain't got to do it no more. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, but I would stay in this hostel. And I remember one day, and this has stayed with me uh, throughout my life. I remember one day going down to the little common area and I was sitting amongst white folks from Switzerland and, you know, all, all over Australia. 
And so they asked the question, where are you from? And I said, Montgomery, Alabama. And they said, oh, Rosa Parks. And then the lady says, oh, you're such a nice black lady. And you know, my head, my head turned all the way around. And I was like, what does that mean exactly? She says, well, where I'm from in Australia, we know black women from the Real Housewives of Atlanta. So I didn't want to create a monument that I knew that would get worldwide attention, worldwide attention just for people to see. I want to be able to teach. So right now we have a curriculum for girls ages 13 uh, from 11 to 14. And it's teaching them through the academic, uh, through the Adinkra symbols about strength and friendship and kindness and spirituality, because we're lacking all of that uh, with our babies. And so with that, that's one that we just unveiled. And the second one uh, is a space where just right around a corner of the street, and this has not hit national news yet. So I'm hoping that you all would keep our secret um, that I purchased the space where these women were enslaved, the hospital. And should I tell them the story, Deidre? Should I tell them the story? So I, uh, we created a, a conference. We had world-renowned Deidre Cooper Owens that came. So the answer to your question is we're teaching. We're providing space for, for midwives, doulas, and medical practitioners to come to learn. Not only that, but we're partnering with universities and high schools. And they're coming and they're learning and getting you know, education from some of the world's best scholars. And uh, so I reached out to the gentleman that owns the building, which is literally about four blocks up the street. And I said, hey, listen, I said, I would like to bring the conference to the backyard, to the Negro hospital where these women were kept and enslaved. And I said, would you mind if we did this? You know, and he said, oh, no. He was like, I thought you were here to buy the building. Tall, white man, gray hair, deep Southern twang, look like Mike Pence. So I said, hmm, the building is for sale? He said, yes, the building is for sale. And I said, well, how much are you selling it for? He said, $100,000. I was like, wow, this is like right around the corner from slave auction. So I said, why are you selling it for $100,000? He said, well, he said, there's paranormal activity happening in this building. And we don't want it no more. And I said, what kind of paranormal activity? He said, my staff hear children crying. They see people walking around. They hear, you know, the lights be on. <laughs> the lights are on and just, just we don't want it, Ms. Browder. And, and, and we left here and four years ago and we don't want this building. I said, $100,000, asbestos, something wrong with the roofs, the floor caving in. He was like, no, nope, we just don't want it. And he's like, there's been times I've been standing there by myself and the hair is on my neck stand up. I said, pants, pants, pants. I said, well, you know what? I think I need this building. You asked me what we're doing now, right? I'm taking you there. So I said, I think I need this building. He's like, oh, really? What would you do with it, Ms. Browder? Folds his arm. I said, I would allow space for midwives and doulas to come in, bridge that gap between OBs and uh, obstetrics, and just really give the history of what happened in this space, but also teach girls about their bodies and how we can, you know, better serve. And primary care, we'll have a clinic in this space where they were tortured. I'm just off the dome. It's the women upstairs that was running around giving me the vision. They were like, girl, tell them this, tell them this, tell them that. And so I said, uh, and so he says, you'll do all that with this building? I said, yes, sir. He was like, well, if that be the case, I'm gonna let you have it for $75,000. I said, wait a minute, hold on, Mike. Are you serious? He said, yes, you can have it for $75,000. I said, let me, can I make an offer? He folds his arm, go ahead and make your offer, Miss Brown. I said, can I give you $35,000 down? Start talking like him. And then he says, <laughs> So can I give you $35,000 down and then you carry the loan? The name of the place was First Son Finance. You borrow a dollar, they're going to get 20 off of you. Predatory lenders. Ancestors were telling you to get on up out of here because you ain't doing the people right anyway. And so he said, 
how long would you need? I said, just give me, just give me two months and I'll have the rest. Southern Poverty Law Center had given us a grant for $50,000. So I had that 35. And so I, he said, I tell you what, Ms. Brown, can you call me back on Monday? Let me go talk to my wife. We're going to call you back when we're on our way to our beautiful farm in Tennessee, 150 acres with 20 horses on there. He's like, let me go. Let me just. So I said, okay. So I called him back. And he says, Michelle, tell my wife what you want to do with this building. I said, ma'am, I, I'd like to give him the whole spill. And she's like, oh, Michelle, that just took me back to, to gone with the wind, y'all, for real. I was like, hmm? she's like, Michelle, we just love what you're doing. We've been watching you all this time. And then I started getting scared because I'm like, why y'all watching me? I'm just, she was like, Mike, uh, Jim, don't, don't play with her. Just tell her what we're going to do with this building. Jim said, Michelle, we don't want this building. Can you just give us that $35,000? You can add this, you can have it. Twenty twenty three, we're breaking ground. We're gonna demo the inside, and we're gonna have a clinic on the third floor. We're gonna have a museum on the bottom floor, so we can teach the history of the mothers of gynecology, and it all stems from the sculpture. And so that's just my small part as a non-academic. They told me I shouldn't say that, but I'm not. I'm not academia. I don't know. Don't say that. <laughs> but um, as someone that loves history and, and, and loves what I've been learning from women who've gone before me and that's teaching us this history, what you're doing, I feel like Nina Simone, that it is an artist's duty to reflect the times in which we live. And Black women, 80% of these Black women, according to the USA Today, are dying and they don't have to. Maternal health, what is the problem with these fibroids? I've had judges to come to the site and we've taken pictures when, uh, what's the judge's name in DC? The, the black woman co co had a big old thing for all the black judges in Montgomery and they came with their black robes and they stood with the monument. And the judge began to cry and she said, I am motherless today because I had fibroid tumors and they took my womb. We are dealing with some trauma. So I wanna create space where trauma killed many of these women, these girls, as a place for healing. That's what I'm doing. Thank you. Well, so we want to kind of open it up now. I think that's a good segue to open it up now for questions. Um, if you are going to ask a question, please come to the mic because we are on Zoom as well. Uh, and in order for your voice to be recorded, we'll need you to come to the mic. So come right here to the mic. Yes, you. <laughs> You're okay. It's probably summer sometimes. Like y'all lucky I just took my shoes off only because I'm with you with those summers. It's like lava is coursing through my veins, literally. I want to just say thank y'all so much for doing this work because this, this conference, I mean, I broke my bank getting here to be here. It was so worth it. I know God's going to provide because I only paid for one deal since I've been here. Everything else has been granted to me, um, but I need to get your book. And I want to know if I can put a picture of my Mr. Potato Head uterus in your center so they can see. I did have a baby one. OK, but my ut my uterus was so riddled with fibroids. My hemoglobin was 8.1. I was bleeding out, dying. I had even fainted. And I believe that there's got to be something connected to our generational trauma, to the white supremacy, to the racism, to the post-traumatic slave syndrome that causes us to internalize the trauma. And, and because before I even had a hysterectomy, I had myomectomy mm -hmm. and they look like skinned crying baby heads. They did, I had that picture, I gotta find that picture. And I said, this is because of the doggone chairperson that was giving me hell. This one was this situation. And I could see, I, I read their faces that there was trauma on all their faces, but the Mr. Potato Head baby uterus, it was like, he was like grinning like, mm, I guess I lost. And it was like, I mean, I look at it cartoonishly, but it's like, these are our stories. And people are like, you, you have a picture? Yeah, I told my doctor to take a picture. He's in the picture like, got it. 
And I show people when I ask them, like, you want to see it? So people say, yeah. When people say, no, I still show them anyway, because this is serious and we need to bring more attention to it. And you should be asking women to put pictures of their uteruses there. Cause I, can I give you my picture? Yeah, oh my God. That'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank one you. of the things, um, so at FAMU, we have um, pharmacy and public health. And so we have a lot of doctoral students who are actually working on um, research and fibroids about Black women in the panhandle of Florida, um, because although there are a series of other health networks, we just do not have mm -hmm. enough information. Um, mm -hmm. And so those are some of the things that we've been trying to do uh, with the history department and also with public health, having those kind of collaborations of, and students really want to do that work. Sure. Um, so I know that there are some studies about Florida in particular, if that's mm -hmm. something that you're interested mm -hmm. in reading more about. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going on a tour too. I'll see y'all. I'm coming. All right. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lizette Wanzer from San Francisco. Thank you so much for this. This has been just wonderful. And I just came from the Legacy Museum straight here. Um, and it's just been a very emotional um, day for me. Uh, I really just wanted to ask you, I know it's a secret. I know we can't announce it. And I know the demo hasn't started, but where is the building? So I can go look at it. Can you tell me? 33 South Perry Street. Okay. So literally four blocks up and yeah, one block over. Okay. Thank you. Can, you. you can, it's about a five minute brisk walk here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But if you hit the contact and arcalucybetsy.org, there is a tour tonight. I'm taking people out and this. Oh. My my sponsors over there got y'all some free food there on the corner with Kukos, which y'all need to let me know now. You need to go go on awesome. and awesome, awesome. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Good afternoon, and it's just such a privilege to be here and to hear this information coming, especially for us. Um, Jenny Tungara, Howard University Professor Emerita History Department. Um, one of we had a, a wonderful professor at Howard University, Dr. Georgia Dunstan who was part of the National Human Genome Project based at Howard. Mm -hmm. And she uh, was working on generational trauma mm -hmm. as perceived through the human genome. Mm -hmm. So looking at generations of Black people and the impact mm -hmm. of constant trauma passed on from one generation to another and trying to interpret that from a scientific perspective. So I don't know if you've seen anything like that. I know a lot of the psycho our Black psychologists are working on generational trauma as a result of the slave trade and beyond. Yeah. So I'd like to hear some of your comments on that, if you will. Thank you. Thank you. So that's um, epigenetics. And I, I tend to get that question quite a bit. And there are ways that epigenetics is being used politically, I think, in really impactive ways. And then there are other ways where I think folk are being sloppy about it. So what your colleague is doing, and I'm, I'm familiar with that work, was doing research that showed the ways that um, Black people, but there were earlier studies like done on mice, so on lab animals, but also on Jewish uh, survivors of the Holocaust. Um, the gene expression changes. So what that means is if a human being or even a, any living thing, actually, any living thing experiences extreme trauma by that, um, it could be physical punishment, it could be starvation, it could be rape, you know, sexual assault, your body, as we know, our bodies are meant to, to, to rebuild. So if I scratch myself, guess what's going to form naturally a scab. So what our bodies do to protect ourselves genetically is the gene expression changes. So the gene expression changes and that can last upwards of four generations. The issue is when you are constantly being assaulted by institutions that are rooted in anti-Blackness, how does it stop? Because the body's used to repairing. And then after a while, it goes, it should revert to normal. 
that's what's supposed to happen. Now those, so that's the impact of work, right? And, and epigenetics is still, I mean, it's very controversial. People are still doing all of this research, but what we do know from decades and decades of research is that the gene expression changes. So the gene isn't permanently altered, just the expression. And it's supposed to revert to normal and, and all living things. So you, you can be a mouse, you can be a monkey, you can be a human being, right? It's supposed to revert back to normal. There's a disruption when it, the, the anti-Blackness or the misogyny or whatever it is, right, doesn't stop, especially in places that are meant to care for you. The ways that it's being used irresponsibly is folk, instead of looking at the actual science, right, because we are not taught good science, unfortunately, in schools. Um, and I say that as a child of, my mom was a retired science teacher and she was always frustrated, you know, with the lesson plans and the rubrics and things. We, we aren't taught good science, um, especially about the body and the internal systems. How it's being used irresponsibly is people will then borrow literally the lessons from these 18th century, really racist racial scientists to say, see, these black people are different. You see, they're biologically inferior. You see, that's why they have all these gaps in IQ and this and that, you know, so they will then use this and not reference epigenetics. They won't reference those projects like you just did, right, with the human genome. They won't say that it's a gene expression that changes, right, or the expression is the change that happens to the gene, not that it's permanent. They'll just say, oh, those people, they're constantly sick. They don't take care of themselves. They don't do this. And I'm sitting here like, no, 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 that's the science from, from folk like Agassi and all of those people who were saying Black people were a subset of human beings. So that's when I get really frustrated because sometimes it's so blurred and we need to be able to like pull it apart and actually explain to people in very easy ways. Nothing I said was inaccessible, right? And so just to be able to explain the science in a really accessible way. But yes, thank you for that. And to your, your colleague who, was doing amazing groundbreaking work. Hi, I'm Dr. Chantella Sherman from the Acumen Group. Um, a lot of my research is on eugenic studies. Uh, <laughs> so my question is about methodology though. Um, a lot of my subjects now are still living subjects and I'm concerned about um, how to not reintroduce trauma, but encourage black women specifically to tell their stories so that we do know, and there's some connectivity um, and we can fight against some of these things, specifically sterilizations in prisons, which are still going on today. I'm gonna defer to Michelle, cause I write about dead people. I'm in the 19th century, 18th century. So I'm gonna defer to Michelle on this. Well, part of our work, uh, what we've done just recently today, no, yesterday, uh, the Rel sisters, they are ripe and ready to tell their stories again. Linda Villarosa wrote a book about Under the Skin um, and put it in the New York Times, connected with us to Joe Levin, who actually fought for the Southern Poverty Law Center that fought for them. Um, and there has been now reparations. A rich white woman out in Seattle. It was like, my family made plenty of money off of black folk. And I wanna do something to help these women, these girls now women. She sent us $50,000 for our GoFundMe. We actually raised about 75,000 yesterday. Ooh. Oh, y'all, we closed on a house. Three bedrooms, too bad for them. All oh, right, all right. They're going in all this right. weekend. Okay. All right. So if you need a story, they are ripe and ready. They're, they're a little, you know, uh, I guess with eugenics, they call them feeble-minded and underdeveloped and all of that, but they clearly understand. Hmm. They picked out their rooms. All right. They're paying, <laughs> they don't have to pay rent anymore. Hmm. Um, and so that's just one of the things that we're doing to uh, talk about reparations and giving back. So uh, we are connected. So if you need to talk to them, they're happy to talk to you. Let me say yeah, this too. Also, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Good. Just very quickly. Good. Therapy is, is great, don't get me wrong, but cultural competent therapists are better. And sometimes it's hard to find those folks. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. <laughs> you know something about that. You graduated from the school. My colleague sitting about you knows it's hard 
to find culturally competent therapists when you are in spaces where there really just aren't a lot of people who look like you. But thank goodness, because of our online access, I would say, if you're going to seek therapy, I, I, my husband and I recently had a situation where the therapist was doing everything right. Everything. I mean, everything right. The woman was kind and considering, spoke like this, so as not to make you feel, you know, all of that stuff. The trauma kept being relived because she was a white woman trained in a white created field and didn't understand that my husband had come He's a black biracial man, but came from a very abusive, very abusive home, very racially abusive school environment. I'm black, black. Like I look black. He looked white. That man has been called the N word probably more times than any of us in this room. And so to constantly bring up his kid, his childhood and this and that, and not understand, he already told you it was abusive. Why you keep doing that? And that's when I had to finally say, so, well, you know, I was being nice, sister, sister with the hard ER. Sister, thank you. You are doing everything you are supposed to do. And we thank you for your excellence in your training. But we are going to have to stop coming to these therapy sessions because the, you're right, the reliving trauma is hard. And so I will say, that's why it's a little easier. I, I tip my hat off to y'all who do the 20th century. And I, it's easy writing about dead folk. It's, I mean, I, it's really tough for me. Sometimes people tell me stories after the talk. I can't, it's it's hard for me to process that. So I would say cultural competency in therapy might be an aid, one of a few aids that can help these, these people who've been victimized to not keep reliving and being mired in that trauma and oppression. Yeah, and then also realizing that you have to respect if someone does not want to retell their story. That's right. Right. Yep. And that that you re victimize, you re injure them, you replicate the violence by doing that. So um, I think just really having the humanity to to be aware enough. Right. That that, you know, some things people just do not and cannot. Right. Relive or retell. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Asia. I'm from Cincinnati, Ohio, from the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And my question is just simple. I want to know if your curriculum, Ms. Browder, is available um, for the public or is it something that needs to be purchased? Uh, it will be available. It will be available in 2023. Okay. Um, it's finished right now, but uh, my doctor, her name is Dana, Dama Anita Riles, Dr. Riles. I have to shout her out because we've been back and forth with this thing. Um, but it will be on sale next year or available for young people. We're trying to get someone to sponsor that for us so that we can offer it. But yeah, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Questions? So thank you. Oh, we have one. Oh, let me tell you the story before uh, Mike comes up. Are you coming up to ask a question, Mike? Or you, oh, look, I oh, put no. you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> oh, Lord. Okay. <laughs> so I'll tell you a funny story. So we, Michelle and I were going to meet him and his wife for dinner. <laughs> so she says, I got to, this is how Michelle says my name. Deidre, <laughs> Deidre, I got to show you my, the, the hospital. I said, okay. So we drive by because we're literally meeting them at a nice restaurant here in, in Montgomery. And I said, oh, girl, I said, I guess you wanted folk to know that the mothers were in the place because the lights were all focused on the image of like just black women in art. And she was like, what? So she slows down and she was like, did I turn those lights off? I said, uh, well, somebody turned them back on. <laughs> when I tell you all you saw, like riding in her car, in our Betsy Lucy, I saw, you know, what, what's on the, the, the emblem. Um, and then I, you would see the lights of like the artwork. So when we come back, like, you know, she allowed me the, the, the privilege of being able to open up the, the door, you know, the key, put the key in the door. We're standing, we're standing there and it was, it was so calm and beautiful. So I've been, you know, I asked her, she was like, everything's fine. And I was like, girl, they were waiting on a black woman a black woman from Montgomery to come into that space. Because I'm telling you, I saw it with my own eyes. I was just like, what in the very day that we came in um, during her first Mothers of, of Mothers of Gynecology conference 
typically, I mean, I, I deal with some heavy stuff, you know, I'm writing about death and I give talks about reproductive racism and, you know, I'm constantly talking about just really oppressive, heavy things. And in some ways, it's not that I don't care. I care, but you become desensitized because it has to become a defense mechanism for you not to fall down and break down emotionally all the time. So I can hear some pretty grim things and remain, like, hmm. I cried so much in that place, all of us, to, I had a headache. I remember thinking, like, oh, Lord, I'm going to go on the plane, eyes looking like I had done cocaine the night before and drank a 12-pack of beer. I, I mean, my eyes are so red. I cried so until I thought it was going to burst a blood vessel. It was like when she announced what she announced, um, you know, that it was hers. We just, it was like a cleansing. It really was a, a cathartic moment. For all of us, every, there was not a dry eye in that place. So if you do have the opportunity, I would say this is quote unquote theory as praxis. This is how I get inspired. So when I talk about institution building, it's not some far off theoretical concept. That's institution building. It was going into, like you said, well, you know, y'all are from, if, if all of y'all have ever been to these small home, you know, little towns, in the South, especially, or in urban areas. I come from Sam, you know, we were both born in Georgetown, but I grew up in Williamsburg County, poorest county in the state of South Carolina, blackest county in the state of South Carolina. We have maybe two grocery stores. We have about 24, 28 of those check cash in finance places. That's what the Sims Hospital was when Michelle bought it. So to know, like you said, predatory lenders, that's why the mothers and their children were stomping up and down, <laughs> making a man's hair stand on edge. You can't come up in here and then re-abuse and commit violence on the com community. I know how violent that is. I was in grad school in LA and then moved to Oxford, Mississippi. I used to teach at Ole Miss for five years. And I remember I was close to South Carolina. So I could drive and go visit my grandmother who was in her early nineties at that point. So my grandmother was always, you know, there's a mean black grandmom and a nice one. She was the mean one. And so <laughs> I would have to wait the grandmama go to sleep. And then I go rifling through her stuff because she was real private. She didn't want you in her business. You know how the older, the older folks, she was born in 1917. She don't want you in her business. So she would go to sleep on the chair. And then I go through her, her things because I knew something was up. Every time I call, I won't speak to Mary. Um, who's calling? This world finance. This is so and so. Why are you calling my 91 year old grandmother? So I'm going through her papers. I realize where mama owes five figures to various finance companies. Who is lending tens of thousands of dollars? 5,000 here, 8,000 here, 12,000 here to a 91 year old woman. So by the time she becomes ill, my mother retires early, moves to King Street to help her. And we literally had to get um, Congressman James Clyburn, he and his mm -hmm. office to help because we thought they were gonna try and steal our house. Mm -hmm. That's why you couldn't prosper in that environment. That's why you couldn't because the ancestral karma wasn't gonna let you do that to us. And that's why Michelle came and now owns it. That for me, when I hear those stories, that helps me to reconceptualize how to write about our ancestors and to know that you got to keep going on because these are the things that inspire. So you might not be quote unquote the academic as you as, as we define it, but look at what you're doing to help shape the discourse and the scholarship. That's institution building, period. Thank you all. Oh yeah, go ahead, Michelle. So, and I know I shouldn't do this, but I do want to invite them to come. Of course. Dietra will be with us, Dr. Owens, Cooper Owens will be there. Um, we're unveiling, there's more imagery, there's more taking down, there's more changing of the narrative that we need to do. And so tonight I'm unveiling privately, and I did this just for Asala attendees, um, to come in to the site and see the next phase of what we're getting ready to do. And then there's gonna be a, a a tour to the Weidman Dance Group. They're, they're historians, they're part of your community. Um, and then I'm gonna take people to the Mothers of Gynecology and it's all 
free of charge. So if you have about an hour and a half later on tonight, if you're not going to the award ceremony, there's going to be a bus and a trolley outside to pick you up at, uh, at 645. 645. And um, just spend an hour with us. It's a free thing. You know what I'm saying? Thank you, Mike, for the tacos. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but you all are, are welcome to come. Just contact at arcalucybetsy.org. Let them know that you're coming. And that's the email. Thank you all so much for uh, coming and joining us today for this panel. Thank you, Dr. Cooper Owens. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and we hope to see you again next year at Asala. Thank you.